from a dad's perspective, what was it like for you when you first found out about what happened to Chessie? It was a moment that I was not prepared for. Um, I'd been a dad for 18 years, um, had three daughters, and a lot of moments of tribulation, a lot of moments of joy and, and fun. Um, but I'd never gotten the, the phone call before. Um, Susan called me, she was in Connecticut, I was in New York, just about to leave for a business trip to London. And Chessie was in Concord, New Hampshire at her boarding school, St. Paul School. And Susan called me and I remember this, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. The, the feeling that I felt was a mixture of confusion, of rage, and mixed into it was a bizarre feeling of failure. Um, you know, as a, as a dad, my role is to protect uh, my kids. And something had, that was very terrible had happened to my daughter and I had not been able to help prevent it. Were there certain obstacles that you had to overcome in order to best be there for your daughter? Yes, and from multiple fronts. Um, on my own sort of emotional front, I had to get out of the way of a lot of my own uh, reactions, my own sort of emotions. Um, I felt a lot of restricted feelings of, um, that I think I've been trained over the years that it's okay as a man to feel. Sort of anger and rage were, were very natural and that's what was coming from me, but I don't think those were the best emotions to bring to the table to help uh, my daughter get through something like this. Um, so I had to find a place to place that temporarily as I learned to process those emotions. And then I faced other extreme obstacles when it came to um, my identity as a um, person who provides for the family from a work perspective. Um, I had been very sort of focused and dedicated towards uh, my job, same kind of dedication that I gave to my family, and there was a, a, a conflict there. There was a conflict from my own reaction of, you know, trying to go through an inventory in my mind. Do I drop these things at work and drop everything? Susan was telling me, go to London, I've got this. She knew it was an important trip, and I made the quick decision, no, I can't, I have to be there with my daughter, and I'm glad, you know, I was. She knew right from the beginning that we both would be there with her through this journey. Um, but there are a lot of expectations, especially I think on, on men in terms of our mindset, in terms of how do we support our family members. And I felt I had to do a lot of active work to overcome those obstacles. You speak about, you know, being there for Chessie and making sure that she knew that, you know, you and Susan were both going to be in this process with her together. I mean, the parent-child relationship, especially in teenage years, can be extremely complicated at best. How did you guys create an environment with Chessie where, you know, even prior to the sexual assault, she felt comfortable coming to you both and, you know, saying, hey, mom and dad, this is what's happened to me? Well, I think the most important thing is to understand, regardless of what kind of crisis you go through with your children, and, and at some point there'll be some kind of crisis to deal with, it's very important to have an established line of communication with your child that's based on trust and mutual respect. And especially Susan um, had a very strong bond and channel of communication with each, with each of our children. And I had invested a lot of time in, in being with our kids. Um, and I think both of those things were extremely helpful in terms of Chessie feeling safe to speak up about what happened to her. Unfortunately, most victims of sexual assault don't speak up. They don't feel that it's safe to speak up even to a trusted adult and they don't think that they'll be believed or listened to, and what's happened to them will be trivialized. So um, I think the most critical thing is to have that um, you know, level of connection so your kids feel free to speak with you, and that's something we, we had done.
A lot of times when people will read a headline or see a story in the news, they think of it as a form of entertainment and they neglect to think about the human beings and the lives that are actually being impacted by whatever that story may be. And, you know, that was your life, that is your life, and you've had that experience. How did you and your family navigate that together? You know, about three months before um, Chessie was assaulted, I read um, an article in the New York Times that said one in four girls will be sexually assaulted before they graduate from university. And I was in Hong Kong. We were in Hong Kong at the time. I was at work and I turned to a colleague at the water cooler and I said, I've got three daughters. This article says one in four will be sexually assaulted. Statistically, this is likely to happen to our family. And again, there I had the reaction that you mentioned in your question. It really didn't sort of hit me, you know, personally. I was maybe delusional in terms of thinking, you know, bad things don't happen to people like, like me. Um, I did spend a second thinking about it because I did make a comment to a colleague. And, and I was thinking of my 18-year-old who's graduating from high school um, and her onward journey to um, university that she was heading towards. And I didn't think that three months later we'd be facing this crisis with our 15-year-old freshman in, in high school. So these things are real. I wish I had been better informed with the data and the statistics. Um, and I wish I'd been exposed to sort of the personal side and hearing stories. But there's so much silence around the topic of sexual assault. Um, you know, when, when Chessie reported the crime and we had to go up a steep learning curve in order to understand the impact of sexual violence of this trauma and how to be best prepared to help her through, you know, through the journey. Um, but we weren't prepared and we had to go through such um, a um, process of making decisions on the fly, trying to use our best judgment. And that's part of the reason why we set up I Have the Right to, to make sure that we can spread awareness uh, because the data says we all know a victim of sexual violence. Um, the sad fact is that person hasn't felt safe enough to speak up to someone. Um, so we, we should all learn about this because in our daily life we're coming across victims on a daily basis. And you know you mentioned how there were some things that you guys weren't aware of how to navigate and had to kind of go off of your best judgment. What were some of those things and you know for parents who their child has just been sexually assaulted what would you say to them now that you wish you had known then? So there are things that we did right, and there are things, especially in my case, that we did incredibly, you know, wrong. Um, I think, you know, my wife handled things um, textbook when she, she was the first one to see Chessie physically. And um, when Chessie told my wife what happened, you know, my wife said, um, I believe you, um, we're here to help you, um, I love you. And these are such critical words we've learned subsequently that the first reaction that a survivor um, faces when they speak up about what's happened to them really helps shape the way that their brain, their body processes it, which can be an indicator of, the he of their healing process. Um, so, you know, Susan instinctively knew what to say. Um, some things that we have didn't do well um, or had... Um, you know, one time when I was driving with Chessie, I um, was driving, looking forward. Chessie was sitting next to me, and I asked her a question, why did you go off with a young man? Um, this was a classmate of hers. Um, she did not know the intentions that he had, but she went off with him. And that was just ignorant dad speaking. I knew as soon as I said it, I wanted to grab the words and shove them back into my mouth and then further down into my soul for asking it because no, no victim um, deserves being sexually assaulted regardless of what they do. We've heard these tropes all the time. You know, what were you wearing? Were you drinking? Why'd you go off with him? Um, none of these things are relevant. You know, if someone does something against someone's consent, it's a crime. Um, 
and you know, many times you're faced with decisions post reporting of a sexual assault and you need to make decisions. And we found the best thing to do is to rely upon the, the foundation of, is this going to be helpful for the healing process of your child? Um, is this going to be something that supports them um, on their journey to justice and well-being? And, you know, for example, one example was Chessie wanted to go back to St. Paul's school after her assault. And my wife and I privately said, there's no way that we want her to go back to that school, you know. And her counselor told us, you know, a lot of victims feel the loss of power through this crime. And if we don't give her some autonomy in terms of making decisions, this can make her feel an even further loss of power. So, you know, after much thinking and talking with the counselor and speaking with Chessie, we decided to support her return to St. Paul's. Um, we did that to support her. Um, unfortunately, we did not realize that the school was hiding, you know, 70 years of um, sexual abuse of their students by adults in the community and other students. And we didn't understand the culture of the school and what she was coming back to. And, and you know, she went back, but three months later, she returned after being bullied and harassed. As a graduate of St. Paul's yourself, what was that like for you to find out that there had been such a history of sexual assault that was being hidden and knowing that, you know, two of your daughters you had sent there and were then impacted in turn? Yes. Yeah, so ironically, we were living overseas and we had the possibility of being asked to move to different locations. So um, I did not want to move my girls in the middle of high school. So we thought, okay, boarding school is a great option to give them some stability before they go off to college. And we only, my daughters, uh, Lucy and Chassie, both applied to only one school, St. Paul's School, because I went there, I knew people there, um, uh, friends, classmates were teachers, some of my old teachers were still there and I trusted that that would be a safe place for my daughter. It was through that experience that I learned the privilege that I have as a man. Um, there was abuse happening at the school uh, when I was at St. Paul's. I was ignorant of it. As a, um, a young man, um, I could be um, oblivious to this, um, and I did have a sixth sense that some teachers were strange and that I should stay, I had the instinct to stay away from them but I, I was not aware of what was going around me. I was a 16 year old boy at the time. Um, but I made the mistake in hindsight, hindsight of sending my daughters to a place that um, did not value um, women um, as much as the boys and into an environment and a culture where girls were viewed not as humans, but as objects um, and targets for these kind of sexual games. Um, so that is, you know, a regret that I will carry me, carry with me to um, my last days. What was the response that you received from the St. Paul's community then when your family came forward? And can you speak to, you know, the concept of secondary victimization and if that was something that you and your family went through and how you navigated that? That's a great question, Sophie. Um, you know, I made the um, assumption that my daughter had done you know, the right thing. She'd been victimized in a horrible crime. She spoke up and reported it to the police. She had learned that her perpetrator had done this to four or five other girls at St. Paul's school, and she did not want him to do it to anyone else, so she spoke up. Um, none of the other victims, unfortunately, had spoken up. And we saw, you know, um, a reaction that was very different from what I expected. I expected the reaction to be the community sort of rallying and surrounding Chessie with love and support. I thought other parents would reach out to us, you know, if you have a child that becomes sick, you know, neighbors come and line up outside your house with casserole dishes and offers of how can we help you. Um, none of that materialized. We learned, you know, sexual violence is a unique crime. It's one that the community prefers to remain silent about, prefers to hide in deep and dark corners, and wants to pretend like it doesn't um, exist. And we face that from the St. Paul's community 
from the board of trustees to the senior administration. Um, what we didn't know at the time, again, was that they were hiding a 70-year history of sexual abuse and cover-ups. Um, and through that process, we learned that, you know, this crime is probably one of the only crimes where this concept of a secondary um, um, survivor and the secondary victimization both come. The secondary victimization is being ostracized by your community and then being bullied and harassed and not being believed. Um, Chessie was, there were claims against Chessie for making this up and ruining this young man's life who's going to go off and do great, um, great things. There wasn't really any focus on Chessie as a human being and as a victim of a crime. And then we also learned the concept of that secondary survivor um, because this, um, um, what happened to Chessie impacted and traumatized our daughter, but it also traumatized our whole family. Um, it impacted our entire life from a 360 perspective. Um, it impacted, you know, where we lived. We lived in Hong Kong at the time and we had to move back on very short notice to the U.S. It impacted my um, career and my, my job at the time. Um, I was, um, uh, had to leave uh, the firm that I'd been with for 14 years and um, uh, leave very abruptly and on terms that I was not happy with. And it impacted my wife and my two other daughters. Um, and through loss of friends, um, isolation, silence, uh, lack of support. And you know, this is one of the reasons we, we decided to form um, our organization again, to realizing all of these forces against um, um, you know, survivors of sexual violence. We needed to provide a new community of support and love for them. Were there ever moments that you and Susan stopped and said to each other, this is too much, you know, it's impacting our family in such significant ways that then you questioned whether or not you were doing the right thing? We never questioned um, if we were doing the right thing. That's the one thing that um, I loved about, or love about our, our family. Um, there were days that we felt like, yes, oh my gosh, this is too much. Um, and we wondered also, when would this end? Because there were so many times where we felt like, oh, the young man has been arrested. The community will believe and rally around us. Then, oh, the young man was convicted in a criminal trial. Okay, finally then, the community is going to come out in support. Um, and, you know, all of these things just led to more... Um, you know, trials and tribulations for Chessie and for our entire um, family. But we had an attitude of, you know, Chessie did the right thing. Um, she spoke out, she spoke the truth, and it activated a sense of um, justice and doing the right thing in every single person in our family. And you know, once that feeling gets activated, it's, a, it's an incredible superpower that sort of permeates everything that you do and it gives you a lot of energy. And through our, our work, we've also come across unbelievable people in our journey of Chessie's healing and seeking justice. So we've been able to reform our community. And um, there is not a day that we say it's too much. We just regret that we don't have more energy um, to, you know, to spend on it. As part of your work with I Have the Right To, you've gone out to many schools and have spoken specifically to young men. For any parents of young men who are watching this right now, what messages do you think are most important for those parents to reiterate to their sons? Well, I think the key for us uh, making any kind of positive impact um, in terms of the data of sexual violence is by engaging our young men um, and their parents. And, you know, I think the most important thing for parents of young men to know is that um, we've spoken to many schools, many times the first questions that the young men ask me is, you know, wanting to talk about false accusations. And I need to remind them, first of all, that the data says you're much more likely to be a victim of sexual assault as a boy or a young man than to be falsely accused of this. 
So um, I think, and that is usually an eye-opening experience for young people, and I think for parents as well, to say, oh my gosh, I didn't know the stats were so high for boys being victims of sexual abuse, sexual assault. Um, so, you know, I think it's important for people to understand anyone can be a victim of sexual violence. Um, I think so many times parents and boys feel like they're targeted um, now. So that sort of pivots to another thing that I think is important to have discussions with boys and their parents is to say, you know, our society has constructed a, a definition or an image of masculinity, one where it's just okay for boys to show anger and rage, to be aggressive, uh, to be the alpha male. You know, that's what society, social media wants our boys to be. It doesn't account for the 70, 80% other range of emotions that uh, men, boys, as human beings, you know, have inside of ourselves. And I think we need to start talking about these positive attributes that we carry as human beings and how do we develop them? Because society, social media, uh, the internet do not say that's the right way to be. How do you then best draw men into the conversation, especially if maybe their back is up against the wall and they feel afraid of, oh, we may be attacked or, oh, we may be, you know, targeted in, you know, as being at fault in a situation like this? How do you then best engage them in that conversation? That, that's a brilliant question, Sophie, and one that I've had to go through my own learning journey on. Um, you know, after we got through Chessie's ordeal, we formed I Have the Right To, and we spoke primarily to victims, victims' families, and other advocates to raise awareness. And um, my, I remember distinctly the first time when I was asked to speak to uh, boys, I found myself panicking a bit because I was not prepared to say, to speak to young men because I still view them in the lens of a father of a, of a sexual assault victim, and I'm looking at them as potential um, perpetrators. And I had to seek the guidance of someone who's become a dear friend now, Don McPherson, and we spent so many hours talking. I'm asking, Don, please help me understand how can I reach young boys? How can I speak to them in a constructive and positive manner? Uh, because my inclination was to go in and say, boys, don't rape. Uh, please. And, um, you know, that's never going to be a constructive way to speak mm -hmm. to any, you know, audience. Mm -hmm. And Don opened my eyes to the concept of aspirational masculinity. Um, so many men are trapped in this box of um, emotions that I talked about before. If it's just being okay to be um, aggressive, you know, um, be the protector, be the, you know, the alpha male. And, um, you know, that is really limiting the potential of our young men. And, you know, speaking about toxic masculinity is going to shut down um, the ears uh, and the souls of the young boys that we're talking to. So Don has helped teach me about speaking about aspirational masculinity and helping our young men realize how can they be the whole person that they're meant to be. And you say aspirational masculinity. If you could give that a specific definition, what would that be? It is, you know, being someone that can experience the fullness of life, um, the full range of emotions. Um, you know, it is okay if you're a man to cry. It is okay to show joy. It is um, hard work, but it is so fulfilling to have empathetic relationships um, with others. Um, you know, these are all things that we learn later in life. You know, unfortunately, what we're reinforcing to our young people is to be, you know, that aggressive young man that we're pushing out onto the sports field mm -hmm. and take what you want, you know, and be aggressive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you see what's you know, that's reinforced through high school, and then we send our boys to universities where a lot of times that sort of frat and bro and party culture can further sort of, you know, create ways of behaving that really aren't realistic for post, you know, for starting a family and going into the workplace. And I think we need to start having more conversations 
um, in all of our parts of our ecosystem, at our homes, in our schools, in the workplace, about what kind of real productive human beings we need. You know, the, the new buzzword in terms of leadership in the corporate world is empathy. Empathetic leadership is sort of a key attribute that a lot of the experts said are, are, is a characteristic that you need to be a, an effective leader. And we're not teaching our young boys to be empathetic leaders in the future. We're telling them to be sort of narrow-minded and aggressive, right? And that means not communicative, not understanding of other people's, you know, where they come from and their emotions. So I think we need to do a better job across the board. How do you then place kind of a, a premium or articulate the value of doing that to men who they may say, hey, you know, we're actually doing pretty well as is. This isn't really impacting us directly. How do you make them care? That is the million dollar question, yeah. Sophie. Um, and our thinking at I have the right to there, because we spent a lot of time thinking about this, because, um, you know, the bell curve that I look at in terms of, um, um, you know, members of our society, you know, I would say when it comes to sexual violence, I'll say maybe they're five to 10% of our population that think it's okay to be this sort of misbehaving person. And maybe there's five to 10% of our population that are just really good people who will speak up and defend people. Then there's about 80% of our people who are sitting there in the middle and saying, their head is on a swivel saying, which direction you know, should I go in? So it's not enough, and I said that to just illustrate, it's not enough to try to talk to people about doing the right thing. Because then you'll just reach maybe five to 10% of the population. Um, we need to give motivations for things to tilt towards the side of good, not to the side of sexual violence is okay, it's, it's acceptable. Right now, everything in our society from a data perspective would say that we're saying that sexual violence is okay. We're not doing anything about this yet, the fact that 81% of our uh, population has faced some form of sexual harassment in their lifetime. Um, that one in four girls are sexually assaulted before they graduate high school, and the stat for boys is one in five. So, you know, we need to start doing something. But we need to get all members of our ecosystem to say, we want to, for example, in the corporate world, we want to hire good candidates, right, for the workplace. And that will send a message to higher ed that we want to provide, as part of our curriculum, training on what it means to be a good corporate citizen, to be a good empathetic human being. And if that's the case in higher ed, then that means in our high schools and middle schools, there'll be more acceptance to say, um, maybe we should have this curriculum for our students. And then from the student's perspective, they say, oh my gosh, if I take this training, I'm gonna have a better chance to get in the university that I want to, and then that'll help me get the job that I want, right? So we're hoping to find partners that believe in the same kind of structure and system so we can create that virtuous cycle to create an improved um, ecosystem. Jesse was sexually assaulted back in 2014, which is almost 10 years ago now. If you could go back to Alex Prow of 2014, what would you say to yourself? I would say um, everything is gonna be okay. Um, you, your daughter will get through this, your family will get through this, um, you'll rebuild a community of love and support that is even better than the one that you had before, that you'll have amazing relationships. You could see maybe your girls not having the same path, but your girls having wonderful opportunities going forward. Um, you know, we did not have much hope 10 years ago when this happened. We did not have much knowledge or awareness, but we learned that. But hope and the light at the end of the tunnel was very hard for us to see at different times. The one thing that we try to tell every survivor and every family that we work with now is, you know, look at us as a potential example of what the healing process, you know, can evolve to. Uh, we can tell you it's not easy, um, but there is hope at the end of the tunnel, um, that there is, um, um, 
you know, healing available, that justice in some shape or form is also available, and that there are people that will believe you, love you, and support you.